Greetings, hello everyone. I'm uh, we're here for the composer in Drupal, the past, the present, and the future. Um, I'm Ryan Anza, Mixologic on Drupal.org. I work for the Drupal Association on the engineering team. Uh, my breadth of responsibilities include things like packages.drupal.org that Composer relies on, and some of the build tooling, and the Drupal CI system for testing, and um, many other things behind the scenes. Uh, and I'm here with... Yep. I'm Greg Anderson, I'm a Pantheon engineer, and uh, I'm involved with projects such as Drush and the Composer and Core Initiative. All right, so what are we covering today? Um, we're gonna talk about what the initiative, what we set out to do and what we are. Uh, uh, cover why we're using Composer, and what is the, you know, what, why is Drupal find value in using Composer, and why are we switching off of what we were doing? Um, what's the Composer merge plugin, and why it was problematic? Um, well, I feel like I'm reading some of these slides here, so. <laughs> um, I'm gonna cover like how you should manage I mean, composer manage site in the future now that we've got this all moved into core and then what the path forward is for sites if you already have a site that is composer managed or a site that is managed using tarballs and then what's it going to look like in Drupal 9 this is a kind of a short list of people that have been involved in uh, the initiative uh, myself Greg uh, Mile 23 has been pretty instrumental in reviewing a lot of patches and providing a lot of patches. Uh, Fiat Proxima has given us a lot of great reviews and uh, Grasmash, he uh, is the co-maintainer of the Composer documentation on Drupal.org so he's got a real focus on making sure that what we build people are able to read about and understand. And then uh, we wouldn't be able to do most of any of this without uh, Webflow because most of the things that we have taken were proven proven proof of concepts in, in the community that we rolled into into core. So he built most of those and has kind of paved the way all along the way. So big shout out to him. So uh, the Composer and Core Initiative. Who are we? What are we doing? What, what, is, what is this specific initiative about? What's the scope? What were we trying to do? One of the main things was to make Drupal tarballs Composer ready. Uh, that isn't the Sole main thing. Um, oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. But, um, so the our project page for the initiative is you can find us at this URL or uh, the short link up in the upper right hand corner will bring you to uh, directly to the initiative page, which is a good way to get to what we're working on. There's also a tag in the issue queue, just just composer initiative, with like two words. So if you find that tag, you'll be able to find all the issues that we're working on, all the things we're trying to do to move forward. So the goals of the Composer Initiative. We have always had Composer as part of Drupal, but we've never had an official documented, this is the way you need to do stuff. This is, this is how to build a site using Composer. This is the proper way. It's always been, well, you should be using Composer because you're going to need to. However, there's no official way to do it. So it's always been in this weird, nebulous space, and we're like, we need to fix that. We need to make it so that this is the recommended way, and this is the official way. Uh, along the way, we realized that core development has often conflicted with the product itself because the Git repository was always a, um, like, almost like an API, like where the files lived in the Git repository are where the files live on your web server. And those two things don't necessarily need to be tightly coupled like that. This allows us to be able to separate those two things and make core development not so uh, dependent upon, you know, breaking backwards compatibility by moving a file. And the tarballs, we wanted to make those composer ready because right now they're generated out of a git clone and if we're changing the git repo to not be the product, we can't use a git clone anymore so we wanted to make the tarball itself Composer ready, so you can just download a tarball and start from there. Still would probably prefer that you start with Composer Create Project, but that's uh, um, part of that. So in order to do that, we had to stop using the Wikimedia Merge plugin. Uh, we wanted to add the scaffolding plugin into Core and add more Composer build support to Core, which is including um, building meta packages that uh, provide safety mechanisms and uh, allow people to have the same 
versions that Core uses for development and things like that. I can interject here. Um, making Drupal tarballs download <laughs> tarballs that Composer ready has an important side effect, and that is that all of the Drush PM code uses the tarballs. So if you do a PM update of your site to 8.8.0, then you're going to be Composer ready. Right. And of course, anywhere that we can improve upon the existing stuff that's in Contrib or in, in the community space, that as we move it into core, we can make it even better, then that was part of the goals. So why do we use Composer? How many people are like very familiar with Composer here? How many people are like, I hate Composer? <coughs> How many of you are the same people? <laughs> um, Anyways, uh, oh, sorry. I, so there's 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 a lot of really good reasons why Core has adopted Composer. I think the primary one is um, the fact that we can rely on third-party modules or third-party code that exists throughout the entire PHP ecosystem and didn't have to be contained with just what Drupal developers have built. And so that allowed Core to adopt things like Symfony Framework and use that to underpin a lot of what Core was doing. And so... Um, as we moved along, we realized that uh, this would be good for module maintainers as well, and this would be a great way for uh, module developers to use Composer to manage their site. And so we ended up with people who are contrib maintainers saying, oh, we also want to use Composer. And then we had site builders that say, and we also want to use Composer, because a contrib module maintainer wants to be able to have the uh, third-party library access as well, so they can say, I'm going to make this contrib module, but all it really is is a wrapper for this cool library that stashes things on S3 that somebody else has already built for me. And so <laughs> that was the maintainer side of things. And then the site builder side of things is like, well, I want to use Composer to download that module and also get all of its dependencies and also get other Drupal module dependencies. So, so as you can see here, the old method of installing using tarball and getting all its libraries, it's several steps. You have to use Drush to download it, Use tarball to get everything into place and you know interacting with the file system and hopefully your SSH and things back and forth and the permissions are right but compose away just compose to require the module and so that solves a lot of things there the upgrade is also simplified you know we don't have to do any library manipulations just composer update so Symphony. I don't remember why this is here. You actually already covered this. The, oh. the whole point is that Drupal 8.8, 8, sorry, <clears throat> Drupal 8.0.0 wanted to adopt Symphony. Symphony's already using Composer. There's a whole pile of things with just one step. Drupal could bring all of that in and say, hey, we're going to do everything for you. Uh, and it's going to be all the same as it was for Drupal 7. But then we had the complication that Contrib Module said, well, wait, I, I want to use this too. Right. So that's where we started to get into this. Right. <laughs> I'm, I'm giving the presentation, but I'm moving the slides forward. That's the <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's also a little bit of history. Like when 8.8 came out, there was no packages.drupal.org. People were using Composer Manager to try and make that happen. Or then Webflow had built a community version of a, the packages for Drupal modules. And then we decided, well, we want to be able to make semantic versioning happen on Drupal.org, so let's figure out a way to make those two things work. And so we built packages.drupal.org around the 8.3 cycle. And the people have been using that and ironing out kinks in that. And then now that we're at the 8.8 cycle, we're like, okay, we really need to fix how Composer's used for everybody because it's, it's, it's evident that it's growing, everybody's using it, and that's the kind of direction. So. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Composer Merge plugin and the upgrade process as it existed before. Um, we still have the Wikimedia Composer Merge plugin as part of Drupal 8.8.0. And uh, what the Wikimedia Merge plugin did in the past is it replaced Drupal Core with uh, the source code was actually inside of the Git repository. So Composer Merge says, take the contents of this Composer JSON file at this path and include it in the root level Composer JSON. So the result of this is that you've got your core directory and the things inside of the Composer JSON in the core directory are included as part of your project, but Drupal Core is not a real Composer project. The Composer APIs can't find it. It's an illusion maintained by the Wikimedia Merge plugin. If you use Composer Require with the Merge plugin, it's going to sort of work. Composer's going to go ahead and put that module 
in the right place because we have the Composer Installers project, which will relocate it. Um, but there's still um, no relationship between the core folder and the rest of the project. If you run Composer Update, when you're using the, the merge plugin and you're only updating a contrib module, this is also going to work. Composer will find the address module, give you the new one, update any of the dependencies in the vendor directory. But if you run Drush PM Update when you're using the merge plugin, this has a problem because PM Update is going to mass replace your site, including the vendor directory. So any of the dependencies that you pulled in from the address module will get overwritten by Drush. So this is historically why Composer and Drupal didn't work well together. So in 8.7, you don't have a good way to upgrade by a Composer, and you didn't have a good up way to upgrade by a Drush once you started trying to use Composer dependencies. So we just sort of stuck, and this was our motivation for revamping things for 8.8.0. Um, so Let's talk about what we've changed and what we're what we're doing here. Um, so the idea is that there is a composer template that all projects get started from. Uh, we've made a couple of them, but we started with uh, two: um, the legacy and the recommended template. And those templates are your starting point, and you'll never need to upgrade those again. They're just they're basically just a here I'm starting my project, and it's and it's the starting blocks, and then from there you you manage your site. And so we put everything that will have updates or anything that will be changed in the core directory. And we use the Composer Installers plugin alongside the new Scaffold plugin to manage the file system layout. So, and then to build the new tarballs, which are not quite working yet because I found that the uh, Drupal org infrastructure has a lot of uh, potential race conditions with different things acting at different times. And we didn't want to package something that wasn't subtree split yet. Um, but when it is, all being built, then it will be built using Composer, and we'll end up with tarballs that look exactly like they do now, except they were built using Composer instead of built using a clone. So the uh, the template that I was talking about, the Drupal recommended project, it's going to give you a relocated dot root, right? So we want to have our web assets under our web folder and our vendor folder outside of that, so that it's not accessible via the web server, so that all of your code lives in vendor. And this allows us to, um, well, it, it's, a stand, it's sort of a standard best practice that people have followed. And that's what the Drupal Composer, Drupal Project layout would give you. And most people have started from that standpoint or to that starting point and move forward. So Drupal Recommended Project is really the non-opinionated replacement for Drupal Composer, Drupal Project. And what I mean by opinionated is it comes with things that you're obviously going to want but it's hard for us to roll them into core and say, yes, you're just going to get Drush, you're going to get console, you're going to get these other plugins. So those things are um, potentially going to be added to the suggests section so that people can see, like, oh, I'm starting a Drupal site. These are all things I definitely need for when I'm starting. The legacy project, on the other hand, is people are still using the old tarballs, and people have built their sites with everything underneath one folder. And we didn't want to force everyone to do a strange upgrade or be in a situation where they couldn't move forward because they didn't have a way to separate their web inventor. So that's what the legacy project template is for, basically just for building older tarballs so that we can make sure that people have parity between what they have now and what they'll have in the future. <coughs> All right, so also in Drupal 8.8, Oh, we have improved the scaffold process. Now, the Drupal scaffold composer plugin was introduced in the third party components, and it's something that Drupal Composer, Drupal Project uses heavily in order to put things into the right place. Uh, the old way would cause uh, a download to happen from Drupal.org for every single file on the system, and this was really a heavy load for Drupal.org. So, <coughs> The new way to scaffold takes a different tact entirely. We now declare all of our scaffold files inside of Drupal core in the composer JSON file. There's a little metadata section inside of the extras directory that I'll show you later. And uh, profiles can add or override scaffolding 
files, as can a hosting provider or the Drupal site itself. And the files are copied into place rather than having to download them every time, which is going to make um, the load on Drupal org a lot better when a core security patch comes out. So in order to enable scaffolding for a profile or some other module, you have to declare it inside of the root level composer JSON file inside of the allowed packages section. Now the reason we do this is it's a little bit surprising in terms of the standard composer module model to have a file copied from one location into your project root. You have to be expecting the project to do this in order for it to actually happen. You wouldn't want to just download some random module and, and have it change your project root. So by default, Drupal Core is allowed to do this, uh, but if you add a profile, you have to specifically whitelist it uh, if you want to let it add additional files to your project root. Once a project is enabled, you can declare your scaffold files with a simple mapping. The key is the target location where the file is going to be placed, and the value is the path where it happens to be stored relative to the project that's declaring the scaffold files. So you can see also that we have uh, template substitutions for the project root and the web root, because uh, you don't necessarily know at the time you're setting up your project whether the site that is going to be using your project is, has a relocated document root or not. Um, so those template substitutions will be replaced with the actual path to the target and everything will get dropped into the right location. Now the fact that we're doing it this way and recopying the scaffold files every time we touch them gives us some additional capabilities we now have the ability to append to the end of a scaffold file. So if you have a Drupal site and you have custom robot.txt content, contents that you would like added to your robots text, uh, this has been a problem for Drupal since well, well before Drupal 8. It's like, you know, how do you manage your customizations to robot text without having it be overwritten every time you do an upgrade? And now we have a way to do that because the scaffold file has an append operation and you can say that for uh, my robots text file, I want to append uh, from the contents of this other file that I provide. And every single time Drupal is updated, this append operation will happen again. So you cleanly get your additions added without having to hack core. You can also remove scaffold files. Uh, in this example, some people uh, feel like you have the README and the change log in your project root, and people might find out what version of Drupal you're running, which is a concern for people who don't update their sites very often. Um, so that's security theater, because you can tell from a fingerprint what version you're running pretty easily. Um, but there are other reasons you might want to get rid of these files. If there's something you don't want, you can just override it, set it to false, and the scaffold uh, plugin will stop managing the file. So the, the meta packages, we uh, touched on those briefly earlier, they are, core itself has a set of dependencies and when we are running core patches all the time, it, we have a specific set of things that Composer resolves to that we're testing against. But what is a meta package? Ah, okay, so those versions then, we are extracting those into a, um, oh, a Composer meta package is really just a manifest of other packages you want downloaded and installed. and so rather than using a composer lock file, which usually is something for a project, but it's hard to ship core's lock file and have people rely on it, we've actually created a meta package that says, here's the exact versions of core's symphony dependencies that you should use if you want to have a tested set of dependencies. Um, and so that's, that's what, uh, what those meta packages are. And we, so there's three of them. There's one that is the core uh, basic dependencies, there's the core dev dependencies, and then there's the core pinned dev dependencies. And the difference between the two dev ones is one is exact versions and the other one is the actual version ranges. But with, um, with the core recommended meta package, one other advantage you get is that it locks all the dependencies at a, at a specific point in time. And so if, say, upstream Twig pushes something out that is not API compatible, that suddenly breaks Drupal, you're shielded from that update. You can keep updating and you're still stuck on that 
you know, pinned to that one version of Twig. So that's one of the advantages of the meta packages. And so, but we have to generate these and make sure that they stay in sync with core. And traditionally, this has been uh, again Webflow building his own, you know, uh, Drupal core strict package and Drupal dev dependency packages. And he had, you know, a Travis build that would kind of keep up, you give or take an hour, but. Sometimes you know we have a security release and we need that stuff right now, and so we wanted to make sure that these meta packages were uh, always up to date. So they're actually in core, and they're being generated by anytime someone is that the next slide? Yeah. So anytime someone modifies core's dependency tree, like if they touch composer JSON or composer lock, it's going to regenerate the meta packages and make changes to the core file system in in uh, in core development. So there's a post update hook that does that composer. Um, and so these are the, the three meta packages, core recommended, core-dev, and core-dev pinned. Uh, the latter two are in the process of being renamed to this. Uh, that issue is almost RTBC, not quite, but. Um, but yeah, so this, and this was all built out of uh, another tool that Webflow built called the uh, Drupal package generator. So you know, yet another piece of the puzzle that we have pulled in from the community to make this possible. The upshot of this is that when you change Composer JSON in a way that modifies the Composer lock, you'll find the meta package generator will run automatically, and you'll have three, well, one to three extra files that are now modified in your source tree, and you just include those in your patch, and that way the, the meta packages are always completely up to date. Every SHA commit in the, the Drupal Drupal project is going to have the right meta package. I just want to back up real quick, because after that gets committed, then we have uh, on Drupal.org our packaging system is watching the repo with Jenkins and then running a subtree split that takes every single thing that has a composer JSON in the core repository and creates components and creates um, the meta packages and also the template files all get subtree split out and so those all exist on packages and on GitHub. For Anything with a composer JSON file in the Drupal Drupal <coughs> repository is going to get subsplit out and it's going to appear on GitHub and in packages. Right, actually, that's what the slide's about. <laughs> oh yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, <coughs> it's really useful because, um, you know, I, ideally, it would, everything would be split up into just individual packages, but, you know, Drupal traditionally has had things with projects that contain a bunch of modules and, you know, uh, <laughs> core, which contains a whole bunch of functionality, but this allows us to like have a whole bunch of things in core, you know, using the mono repo method so that you know we can change everything all at once. But then they're managed as individual little things, so end users only need bits and pieces of it. So, um, and then you know on the Drupal.org side of things, uh, we are going to be changing our tarball generation script to use Composer create project instead of get clone, so that these will all be built the same way using Composer. Um, All right, so this slide shows the general layout of the Drupal recommended project. In the traditional third-party maintained components, we had the aforementioned Drupal core strict and Drupal core dev dependencies, and both of these projects in parallel had dependencies that were overlapping, and it made it really difficult to run Composer update if you didn't do things exactly right in lockstep then Composer would say, I can't update this one because this one's in the way, and I can't update this one because this one's in the way, and you get this multi-page set of messages about dependency conflicts that's really hard to parse. So what we did instead in <coughs> Drupal 8.8 is we made our meta package, a Drupal core recommended, chain through to Drupal core. So if you use Composer to update Drupal core recommended, then you're going to get an update of Drupal core at the same time, um, which makes it a lot easier on Composer and easier on the user to figure out what's going on. Um, the other change we did is Drupal core dev by default now does not pin to a specific version, but instead has the same version constraint range as uh, Drupal Drupal, because we figured that this was more useful in terms of uh, you know having the things you need in order to do you're debugging without being hard pinned, and it makes the, the upgrade easier. Um, and this shows how uh, Drupal Core is recommended currently as self.version. So Drupal Core recommended is going to have tags that parallel all of the Drupal versions, 
and uh, Drupal core is the same way. So self.version lines up. Uh, but since we're generating this file, uh, we have the plan to just actually write the version of Drupal directly into the uh, core recommended meta package. It'll work the same way though. <laughs> and here's Drupal core dev. This shows you that it has not specific uh, versions, but version ranges, and the behat mink and behat mink selenium 2 drivers look complicated. These are workarounds for projects that have not had a, a stable release in three and a half years, which causes us some problems, but we're doing the best we can so that it doesn't cause problems for you. That's my fault. <laughs> it's not your fault. One of them is. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be anyone's fault if they actually had package uh, stable releases every two years or something, right. but they don't. So. Um, the other really neat thing is that you know we've built this cool set of functions, but uh, it's going to make it easier to manage your site, but some people actually do get left behind. You know, We're trying to do the, the Dries train tracks, where your train just keeps going down the tracks and you, you don't have any um, difficulty in upgrading from one version to another, but in practice, sometimes even minor releases cause problems for specific sites that are pinned to specific modules that have problems upgrading due to API changes. So if you get stuck on Drupal 8.7 or even 8.6, uh, we've got an out for you. You can still use the new stuff. Uh, you just use the same version of the scaffold tool from Drupal 8.8, but our core recommended and our core dev, we have back produced those for all of the old versions of Drupal uh, so you can just include a version of Drupal core recommended for 8.7 or 8.6. And these older versions are kind of magic because instead of chaining directly to <coughs> Drupal core, there's another meta package called scaffold assets. And this has all of the scaffold files that appear in Drupal core in version 8.8, but you know the old versions of Drupal didn't have the, the asset files. So we've made an adapter package that's just silently behind the scenes inserted into your flow so that you can use the new stuff with the old versions of Drupal. And this is just what it looks like. It looks exactly the same as Drupal core. It has a composer JSON and it has the file mappings that declare the normal Drupal scaffold files and says where they go in alignment with what Drupal 8.8 is doing. We also have Drupal core dev pinned, um, and this is similar to Drupal core strict in that it pins to very exact versions of each dev dependency. And we really don't think that any site is going to need this, so um, you know, we're discouraging people from using it. It's there if you somehow discover that you have a need to pin to an exact version of the dependencies that Drupal is using, um, but really we're only intending to use this for the download archive tar generation because we want to have a very high fidelity process to create a, a tar ball that's exactly the same as what you get from the Drupal Drupal repository. But yeah, the, the, the only tar balls that use this now, uh, our current tar balls that you download from Drupal.org do not contain the dev dependencies unless it's an actual development version of core, then then the development things are there. So that's basically what this is for. Right, but if you do run composer install and pull the development dependencies in, then you'll get them in the exact same version as you, as you would if you had the um, git core. Oh yeah, I'm doing this part too. Yeah. <laughs> Path forward for existing sites, how do you upgrade? So, uh, as I mentioned before, if you run Drush PM update and your site goes to 8.8.0, then Drupal core is automatically composer ready. Uh, you can start composer requiring. If you've never used any contrib modules before, uh, then you're already good to go. Uh, but if you are using contrib modules, you somehow have to get that list of modules you're using into your composer JSON file. It is on our roadmap to provide an official Drupal org provided tool for doing this uh, conversion. It's not ready yet, but there is a community project, GrassMash Composerized Drupal, and that will take an existing tarball-based Drupal site, and it will convert it to the community 
Drupal Composer, Drupal Project with the relocated document root and all of the Composer things involved. So our recommendation for today, if you want to get onto a Drupal 8.8 site managed by Composer and you have a site that's not managed by Composer, then you should run this tool and go to the community-based version and then you should convert from the Drupal Composer Drupal project layout into the Drupal core. And so um, how you do that is pretty easy. There are a number of files or projects that the community provides and uses and all you need to do is map those to the new names that we're using in um, Drupal core. So we're going to change from Drupal Composer Drupal Scaffold into Drupal Core Composer Scaffold. And similarly, Drupal Core becomes Drupal Core Recommended. And uh, you can just remove the Drupal Core Strict and uh, flip over from using Drupal Core Required Dev to Drupal Core Dev. And that's most of it. Then also <coughs> later on in your uh, Composer JSON file in the Drupal Scaffold section, uh, the old <coughs> version of Drupal Scaffold has an initial configuration tag that you don't need anymore, so you can optionally just remove it. And then the other thing you need to do is set up a locations element that declares where your web, web root goes. And if you want your web, web root to go somewhere else, like if, you're, if you need doc root for some specific hosting provider, then you can change that in your composer JSON and you don't have to make symlinks or do any other funny fanciness. So do you have to commit uh, to upgrading? Well, if you're already running Drupal Composer, Drupal Project, you can keep doing that until Drupal 9. And uh, Webflow has already declared that he's not interested in making Drupal 9 versions of these um, packages. So um, you're going to be obligated to switch at Drupal 9 time. We hope that people will switch before Drupal 9 because as I mentioned, um, it's a big load on Drupal org whenever a core release comes out and all of these Drupal scaffolds start downloading these files all individually. And it's pretty easy to upgrade, uh, so hopefully this will happen. This is your section, right? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so in Drupal 9, um, kind of a question of like, let's say, what are, what's the goal? What are we hoping to do? Well. First of all, right now we've kept all of the um, kept all the scaffold files. Uh, Start with the bottom bullet here. The scaffold files are exist in both places because we weren't sure if that was going to break any backwards compatibility. If people were expecting a file to be there in the tarball in the Git repo, they're there, but they also are duplicated in a scaffold files directory in core. So we have a test to make sure that people don't modify one and not the other. So basically, we've, just, we've literally got copies of stuff in core that are duplicates if they need to be duplicated. In 9, we're going to remove the original one so that all that is left when you clone a git repo from core, there'll be just a core directory and there won't be anything else. Or, well, a composer directory too. Now, um, the root custom, I'm not sure what this one is. Actually, the first one. Oh, okay, sorry. The So when you, when you clone um, Drupal core, your getting a development version of core. You're getting the version that you should be using for writing patches to core, working on contrib modules, doing actual development, but you should not be using that for a site. And so there's stuff in the root composer JSON that's customized for core development, and the expectation is that you're not gonna be operating that in place, you're not going to be you know, doing like normal site management stuff with a Git clone. You, know, you should always be using a composer project to be doing that, or a tarball. The reason we do this is it's like imagine at some point someone wants to change the way scaffolding works and they have to change the way scaffolding works at the same time they're changing the files that are being scaffolded. And this allows you to do one patch that modifies the scaffold tool and also modifies Drupal and uh, then they'll be tested by the test bot together. The uh, Core Composer scaffold plugin is included as a path repository so that when you know when you do start with your git clone and there's only a core directory and then you do a composer install it'll find that plugin and then run it because it it sees it in that path repo so it acts as if it were a package that were already downloaded for you so that's that's what causes it to kind of unfold all the files into place um, 
then yeah, there's no vendor directory in Git, of course. Like so, when the composer installed, that continues to work. And then, like I mentioned before, we're going to be removing all the scaffold files. Now, there's sort of a, a future that we talked about for Drupal 9 into Drupal 10. That you know, we were like, well, how far down the composer rabbit hole can we go? And a lot of that depends upon how much better we can make it perform. And so we've got like several ideas about. I don't, I don't, I'm sure a lot of you have, that have been using Composer have spent a lot of time waiting on Composer, and there's a lot of reasons for that, and I've seen the reasons, and I think we don't need any of them. So uh, I think we've got a lot of paths forward to making Composer run not in minutes and not use a gigabyte and a half of memory, but to be able to like reduce it down to where it's a very quick, very useful thing, but you know, we still have some experimentation to do. But once it's there, then we can do stuff like use Composer to power automatic updates and use Composer to manage extensions in general. So like the update manager that's the GUI built into core, that would be nice for people to someday be able to install modules that have Composer requirements via that interface. And so eventually it could be where Drupal's entire dependency management layer is replaced with Composer and we don't have to maintain that code anymore. We're completely off the island for things we're doing there. So. Yeah, if you're interested in this, come and find us in the sprint room. We don't have a large enough margin to, to talk about composer optimizations here. Yeah. But we've really got some good ideas, and I think it's going to work out. So like in, in uh, 9.x, the composer Wikimedia merge plugin is still sitting there. So there's um, some people may have are maybe are relying on that to uh, do custom modules to have it included in their route. Uh, you'll probably need to add that back in. Uh, we just want to make sure that it wasn't definitely part of core. So. Um, if you need it, the the Drupal core is no longer in there because it's a path repository, right? Yeah. So the so whenever you check out core, it's using the version that you've checked out, looking at the path repository to figure out which version of core you have. So it's this kind of circular thing with the path repos, and of course there's the uh, scaffold plugin, and currently there's another path repo for vendor hardening that makes sure that the vendor directory doesn't have any test files or other things that we don't want in there. So that's sort of a throwback to everything goes under one doc root, which you know, if we can get rid of that idea, if we can get everybody on board with using a web root and a vendor directory separate from each other, then we may be able to get rid of that security issue because... Yeah, so vendor hardening only exists if you're using the legacy project. If you use the recommended project with the recommended doc root, it's not even in there. Yeah, and... Um, can go on to questions, but first we'll say that uh, there are going to be contribution opportunities. The mentored contribution is going to be at 9 a.m. in foyer two. And it's going to be a first time contributors workshop at nine o'clock in the Diamond Lounge, and general contribution is going to be in foyer two. Hashtag Drupal contributions. And also please provide feedback for the uh, the session. Um, also in the upper right hand corner, again, we have the short URL for the project page for the Composer Initiative if you want to get more involved with what we are doing. So yeah. you can open for questions. Yeah. 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 Um, I have a question there. Um, Multi-site support. How have you had that in thought? Kind of how to handle that when you have diff uh, several sites using the same code base, but they might want to have different versions of modules under sites folders. Like Composer optimizations, I think that our margin is too small to talk about multi-site with Composer. Composer itself does not support uh, the concept of multi-site very well at all. Uh, it would be possible to shoehorn the concept of multi-site into Composer, and there's a big issue in core that I commented on, and like, if I were to write it, this is how I would write it, but I have no interest in writing this because it's alien to Composer. Um, but if you're interested in that, you can come down to the um, sprint room area and we can talk about it. Is there any reason Composer patches wouldn't work with this? Composer patch does work with this, and it's going to be one of our suggested. It's not yeah. included, right? It's just suggested. Not suggested. Uh, yeah. And um, it, it's not something we're pulling into core because the community project works exactly the same way that we would make it work. So we don't see any motivation for changing it at all right now. Um, you mentioned 
the part about going from the Drupal composite uh, project, project to the new way, and it's by replacing some of the packages. How do you do it? Do you do composite remove and then composite reply, or you change the composite JSON and then update and just log? Yeah, my suggestion on that slide was to just change your composer JSON and then, then run update. But if you remember the Dries note from yesterday, um, we got together a, a list of composer commands that you can run three in a row. And Ryan mentioned earlier that we're renaming the dev dependencies to core dev instead. And so that will allow us to use a wildcard. And then we should be able to get an upgrade from Drupal 8 to Drupal 9 in a single composer line. But for now, just change the composer JSON. Yeah. Well, I think we're in our time box with yeah. questions and everything. Yeah. How about that? Cool. Well, hey. Thanks. Thank you. Do come and find us in the spring room if you want to play with composer. Yeah.